Uh, we started this series called New to Old. Uh, old to New, sorry, backwards, rewind. You don't want to go that way. You want to go the other way. Old to New, right after Easter. Uh, and we took a, a hiatus over Mother's Day weekend to celebrate moms. But this series was born out of our, our heart because the Bible says if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And Jesus came, it also says, to give us a full life and to live life to the full. So it begs the question, how do we do that? Are you with me? How do we have this new life that God has promised us when by our calculations on Easter, 117 people raised their hand indicating that they made Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life? But here's what I know and here's what many of you know, that's the starting line. That's not the finish line. That's kind of kicking off of the blocks, giving us momentum into the life that he's called us to live. But how do we do that now? Like, how do we have this, this full life? And so this series was born out of uh, the desire to answer that because I believe the answer is found in some of Jesus's final instructions before ascending back to heaven. So after he rose from the grave, he's walking around and, and he, he interacts with his disciples and his, his mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, they all see him. And so they're, they're super excited that he's back. They're like, you're here. It's true. You're Jesus. You're the Messiah. What should we do now? Can you imagine the conversations that they had with Jesus after seeing him again, being raised from the, the dead? They're like, what do you want us to do? Let's go do it. Let's, let's charge the hill. Let's go. And Jesus is like, all right, you ready? You want to know what to do? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just tell us. Just let us know. Kind of, you know, we'll do anything you want. And Jesus is like, all right, here we go. Here's what you're going to do. And so they all lean in. They're ready. Like, all right, we're fired up. Let's go. And he says, Wait. Wait? Like the thing that humans are notoriously the worst at doing? Are you with me? Waiting? Can you hang out with me for a few minutes, Steve? He's just waiting, right? Like we don't want to wait. He's like, I want you to wait. You're like, wait for, wait for, for what? He's like, I'm going to send someone who's going to help you, who's going to be in you who's not just gonna be around you, he's gonna be in you and with you. And I want you to, to wait here for the Holy Spirit. And they're like, the Holy what? That's weird. And what does that, that mean for us? In fact, I'll say this. This might be a word for somebody here today that when he says wait, see, some of you are so, you're ready to take matters into your own hands. But it could be the word of God to you today saying you to wait. Hey, just wait, because he always gives us something better. How many of you know that? Whatever it is he's promised us, it's always an upgrade. He's not the God of lesser, he's the God of greater, and he has something better in store for us. And so he tells these guys to wait here for the Holy Spirit. They don't know what to do with that. He's like, no, there's this helper. There's this counselor. How many of you know we need some counseling in our world? There's this helper. In fact, uh, one version calls him the, 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 the guide or the advocate. And he's going to be, you know, imagine how great it is that I've been with you for the last three and a half years. And we've, we've walked around and done some amazing things. But when I go, I'm not with you anymore. I'm actually going to be in you. The mind of Christ is going to be in you. The power and the will of God is going to be in your, your life. So I need you to wait here. In fact, this is what he says. Wrap your mind around this you will do even greater things than the things I've done. That's a bold statement, but that's not my words. It's Jesus' words in John chapter 16. So Jesus says, I need you to go, and I need you to pray, and I need you to just wait. Don't do anything yet, because if you try to do something without the Spirit that I'm sending to you, it's going to go really poorly for you. It's not going to go well. So you're going to need the helper. He's going to guide you. He's going to lead you into all truth and understanding. He's going to bring you peace because you're going to be in some situations in this world. You will have trouble. And he's telling his disciples in advance, you're going to be in some, some troubled situations where you're going to need peace. He's going to be joy when all the world looks on and says, how can you have joy in the middle of that circumstance? He's going to be your joy. This is what he's going to bring you. So he says, wait here, wait here for the amazing gift of the Holy Spirit. And they go, okay. And they go to Jerusalem and they, and they get in this room and they pray. The Bible says in one accord, they pray together. So let's just, let's do that now. Let's one more time, let's invite God in his presence. 
with us today. God, we invite your spirit and your presence with us today. Amen. That's it. I just had to do it one more time. All right, thank you, Steve. Thanks, buddy. I'll see you in a few. We get to this book of of Acts, uh, and I would encourage you to go read on your own, chapters 1 and chapter 2, but the Bible says that they are all sitting, and they're praying, and they're waiting, as Jesus told them to wait. And so we're going to talk about one of the first things that Jesus talked about when he came back from the grave, the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I understand. This is problematic. Why? Because nothing has been more misunderstood Nothing has caused more division in the church, right, than than talking about this beautiful gift that we've been given from God, the Holy Spirit. Because how many of you know, we get God. God is love. That's what the Bible says. You know, that's what we grew up maybe uh, hearing and believing. God is love. God, you know, he's the, the love of God, or we understand Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice for us and how he gives us grace and he gives us mercy and forgiveness and so we all can wrap our mind around around Jesus, but then we get to this other part of this mysterious trinity, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit brings uh, something called power and humans are notorious for misusing power and for misrepresenting what godly power looks like and so because of that, the Holy Spirit's been blamed for a lot of crazy stuff that we shouldn't be blaming the Holy Spirit for, but we should look, you know, at, at each other or, or in the church. And so what a lot of churches do and denominations might do, and if we're not careful, we could do this too, is we could put the Holy Spirit on a shelf or put him on in a nice little box to, to not get us into too much trouble and to not make things go, you know, too crazy, you know, or, or weird, or we might downplay his power and his ability in our life. And what happens is we marginalize him. And we suppress the work that he wants to do inside of of us. We misunderstand him so we don't teach on him well. And all of a sudden, the greatest gift that God ever gave to humanity isn't able to accomplish all that he wants to accomplish in and through our life. And again, this is a dangerous proposition to discuss. In fact, I was thinking about this. It might be less divisive to talk about politics in here this morning. But probably not. All right, just throwing that out there. Not even close. But because there is so much misunderstanding around the Holy Spirit. And we all have it. In fact, I personally started to have huge misunderstandings about the Holy Spirit when I went to college. I was about 20 years old. I went to Asbury College in Kentucky. So we're talking like backwoods in Kentucky. And so we would go and find a church. And here's just a note for everyone. Here's just a quick little rule. If you ever go into a church that has like several names in its title, Like if it says, you know, the first apostolic church of the good shepherd of the rolling hills of Kentucky, fellowship, you know, Bible, whatever, like you know it's going to be crazy up in there, all right? It's going to be on like Donkey Kong when you walk into that room. And if they tell you up front, hey, we are spirit-filled, okay, what they're saying is is we're going to embrace anything and everything and even more perhaps than what the spirit is all about. But my friends and I, we started looking for a church to go around, you know, to find it in Wilmore, Kentucky, my first year in college. And, and so we walk into this church, this meeting in this school uh, called Great Commission Fellowship. It didn't have a long name, and so we didn't know, right? So we walked in there, and so we, we, we sit down, and we're just kind of, all right, worshiping God and just hanging out. And all of a sudden, this guy yells, Rah! and he starts running around the room. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And he's just racing around the room. Like he's doing these laps. And my friends and I were looking at each other going, what in the world? And we're just watching this guy run circles. He did like six, seven circles in the room. By like the fourth or fifth lap, we started taking bets on his lap time. We're like, I don't know. What's it going to be? You know, right now we're, we're timing the guy. And so he's just I'm like, who is this? What is happening in here? Come to find out later, he's doing something called a Jericho sprint, which if you know anything, the, the Bible says, in the Old Testament, there's a story where God, you know, wants to deliver the, the Israelites and deliver Jericho into their hands. So he tells them to go march around the building for, you know, for march around the city for seven days. On the seventh day, do it seven times and let out a shout. And this is what he was doing. And when you let out a shout, you know, the enemy's supposed to, to fall, be delivered into your hands. So something connected with him in the song that we were singing, you know, to have him want to break some walls down in his life. And so he just shouts and he starts doing sprints. 
and I know enough about God and about worship that I'm supposed to just, I'm not to focus on this guy running around the room, however awesome he is, right? He's amazing, to just try to focus my attention. And so I'm like, God, all right, God, I'm just gonna pray. I wanna focus on you. Like, I hope this guy sprints some more because it's amazing. But I'm gonna right now, I'm gonna put all my attention on you and focus on you. And so he's running. And so I just try, try to worship, you know, in the middle of this. And then behind me, this guy stands up with a tuba, like a mini tuba in one hand and a baby in the other hand. I'm not making this stuff up. And he's in the back. He's not a part of the band. And he goes, and he's playing this thing. And he freaks us all out. We turn around like we're terrified. And he just smiles at us because I think he meant to do it. And when he smiled at us, and I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be kind here because this is backwoods Kentucky, but he has what, what we call March Madness teeth, where he's down to the final four. You guess what I'm talking about? This is Kentucky for you, all right, all over the place. And, so he's, and I'm like, I'm not even mad at this guy. He's, he's blowing this thing. He's got a baby. One guy's doing laps. I'm like, this is the best church I've ever been to in my life. And it was all in the name of the Holy Spirit. Like, we're spirit-filled. Whatever the spirit wants to do is what we do, and we just follow the spirit, you know, no matter what. And so my misunderstandings began, and I'm like, so is this really what the spirit does? Is this really how the, the spirit operates in our, our, our life? Because whenever we talk about the spirit, everything changes, does it not? Guards go up. Or based on your past experiences, you know, you have, you kind of already have this baggage you know, because of, of how you were brought up. But again, we get the Father, God the Father. We understand him and love, and we understand Jesus, but we get to this unseen spirit. It's like, what do we do with this? And humans will always misuse under the, the guise of the, the, the power of God. The Holy Spirit will misuse power for our own glory, for our own attention. And so we need to talk about it. And this is going to be an intro into the, the Holy Spirit. This won't be a full, you know, complete study of him because we don't have enough time to do that. But I will tell you this, church, stay tuned because that's coming. But we're gonna spend several weeks talking about the Spirit and how he works in our life. But I want to say this, and we're gonna see this in a minute. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit is most active in your life, you're gonna do some things that are weird according to the world. You know that? Now, I'm not saying we're going to turn into that church that I was a part of in Kentucky, right? And some of you, you know, are like, you know, wigging out. Or is that where we're going? Or others of you are excited. You're like, oh, sweet. Next week, I'm bringing my, my shofar and my snakes, you know, and just do that. Don't do that. But I will say this, and, and I do mean this, all kidding aside, if, if the Spirit compels me to do something that is that has been in, in God's word and God's ordained it, I hope I obey. If the spirit compels you to do something that lines up with what God's word says, then I hope you obey. I hope you get to that place because we miss out when we marginalize, when we try to, to, to put him in a box, when we're trying to afraid he, he might act out or you know be off-putting to other people. The thing that we might miss is a simple fact that there has been no greater gift that has been given to humanity than the, the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us the, the ability to do God's will on this earth. The Holy Spirit, maybe even the greatest thing, is what allows you and I to experience freedom in our life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom. And if I want anything for this church, you know what I want? Freedom. I want you to have freedom. I don't want you to continually be stuck and bound in chains and locked in sin patterns in your life. That's not the life that Jesus came to give us. And so the Spirit is what allows us to live this free life. So why would we want to box him in? Why would we, we want to try to contain him or downplay, you know, his role in our life or, or never bring him up? Why, if, if, if we want freedom in our life, would we not understand that the Holy Spirit is the answer to that freedom? And so Jesus looks at all these people and he says, hey, before you guys do anything in my name, I want you to wait. 
You have to be full of the power of my spirit at work in you. Otherwise, it's going to go really bad for you. You're going to look really silly. So just go and wait. And so that's what they do. They go find a room in Jerusalem where the whole thing began and where one day it's all going to come to a beautiful ending. He says, go find this room, and I want you to get together and pray. And there were about 120 people or so on this mission, is what the Bible tells us. They gather in this room, and they're all praying. And then all of a sudden, it happens. And you should go back and read this in Acts chapter 1 and 2. Guess what happens? Weird stuff. Weird stuff. Listen, I, I'm just being honest. I can't get into it when people say, all right, let's, let's pray, Lord. I pray that the fire falls from heaven and tongues of fire land. Listen, that's weird, all right? And it's okay that it's, it's weird. It's okay. This is, this is different stuff. So all of a sudden they're sitting there, and as they're praying, look at it. It says this, a sound from heaven, like a violent windstorm. Put that, that verse up there, 2 Corinthians 5. So, no, not that one. Where are we? way behind. I think I messed you guys up. There you go. Suddenly a sound from like a blowing violent wind. So in the ESV version, it says a mighty rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were, were sitting like a wind. In fact, that's the first metaphor uh, to help us as humans in our finite thinking understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Because here's, here's the deal with wind. You can't see it, but how many of you know you can feel it? Or you can't see it, but it moves things. You can't see it, but it's an undeniable force. Like we've all seen the destruction when wind is out of control on this planet can cause tornadoes and hurricanes and tsunamis, right? Wind is powerful. We've also seen its ability to create energy when it's harnessed, you know, correctly. So it says this, oh, violent wind, a mighty rushing wind filled the entire house. So wind is the first thing that teaches you and I about the Holy Spirit because you can't see him. He is unseen. You don't know where he's coming from. You don't know where he's going. He's a little like Cotton Eye Joe in that regard. But when he shows up, powerful things happen. When he shows up, there is no denying his presence. When he shows up on a person, there is no denying. So the Holy Spirit brings fruits of the Spirit, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Right when he shows up, there's no denying that he's there. That's, it's, it's, you, you start to display the gifts and the fruits of the, the Spirit. And then it gets even crazier. It says this, all of a sudden, this mighty rushing wind, this violent wind, and I don't know what that looked like, but here's what happens next. Put it up there. It says tongues of fire. Now, that's some backwoods Kentucky stuff going on right there. Tongues of fire. It says they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that had separated and, and came to rest on them. Rest on them. Now, here's what I know about fire, because this is another metaphor, and this is also teaches us about the work of the Spirit in our life. Fire, we assume, is something that is destructive. But do you know fire's goal, its ultimate goal, was not to be a, a destructor, was not to destroy things. It is to purify things. It's to refine things. Fire is a purifier. Right? We are, we are made pure through, through fire. And so here's another aspect of the Holy Spirit and his job in our life is we all still have this flesh, this, this earthly you know, part of us. We still have the residue of sin in our life. If you cross the line of faith and said yes to following Jesus, then you are forgiven. You are free from the penalty of that sin. But we still all have this earthly flesh. And so his job is to come and burn up all the areas of our life that won't last. All the areas, all the, the, the parts of our life that will destroy us, all the parts of our life that will damage us, that will take us out, his goal is to come and burn those up from our life, but to leave everything else in our life that will remain. All the parts that are eternal, all the good parts of your life, all the parts that, that you know, allow you to be an image bearer of God, all those parts stay, all the, the gifts and the talents and the purposes that he put in your life, he doesn't destroy those. What he does is he purifies those, he refines those. Are you with me? And so he keeps those, and we call it sanctification in the church. But it says tongues of fire came and fell and rested on them, and then it gets even crazier. It says they start speaking in other languages. Now it was the week of Pentecost, uh, which means there were people from all over the region, all over the nation who gathered for this annual celebration, this annual feast, 
called Pentecost. I know sometimes we can hear that word Pentecost and think, ooh, that sounds freaky. Here's how freaky Pentecost is. Are you ready? You know what it means? 50. Ooh. Right? That's all it means, it's 50. And it was 50 days after Passover, right? After God delivered his children out of Israel that they celebrated receiving the law. And so now Pentecost for us is 50 days after, you know, Jesus has, has been raised from the dead after his Passover that we celebrate not the, the written law, but that God writes his law in our hearts through his spirit, giving us the, the Holy Spirit. So they're sitting there and they're celebrating Pentecost. And so people are from all over in Jerusalem. And so they hear something on the inside of this room where this church service has, you know, gone crazy, and they hear people speaking in their own language. In fact, I'll paraphrase verses 7 through 12. Uh, it says all the people on the outside were saying, wait, aren't these people Galileans? They can't speak other languages. Like, they don't, they don't have Rosetta Stone, right? They can't speak this stuff. They don't know what they're, they're like, they're hearing all of this in this, this service because of the miracle that's happening. Some people instantly put their faith in Jesus, but the masses that were there, they couldn't wrap their mind around it. They couldn't understand it because it is otherworldly, right? They didn't know what was happening. It's weird. And so here's what they said. Verse 13, look at it. I love this. It says this, but others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're all just hammered. That's what's going on up there, right? They're, they're drunk. They don't know what they are, are doing. They don't know what they're saying. They must be drunk. Now, Peter catches on to this little, uh, you know, conversation that's happening. And the guy who for three and a half years did nothing but, you know, kind of screw things up in Jesus' name. He had a great heart. He gets up and preaches his first sermon. And now he's full of the Spirit. And the Bible says that 3,000 people that day gave their life to Jesus, believed in the message, and they repented, gave their life to Jesus. Yeah. And on the spot were baptized because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in him. Do you know what happened first? Weird stuff. And thank God they didn't contain it. Thank God they didn't suppress it. Thank God, you know, that they didn't try to put it in a nice little box to make sure that culture, you know, of the day wasn't offended, you know, by this. And I just think if we're not careful, Elevate Church, sometimes we could do the same thing. We get so, you know, uh, in a routine of arranging our church services in a certain way, not to, you know, offend anyone or make sure that, that culture is okay with it. And we forget, though, the only hope for culture is the Holy Spirit of God. Like, that's it. It's the only hope that we have. Not cool services. Not great lights. Not, you know, awesome music, right? Like, none of that matters. All of this is in vain if people don't walk through these doors and they don't experience a nice talk, they don't experience good music, but they experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Nothing else matters because he's the only one that can change you. He's the only one that can make a difference in your life. He's the only one that can take you from old to new and make all things new. No one else can do that. Music can't do that. He's the only one that can change us. So here's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.20. He says, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's powers. So I'll just say this. Who cares about this sermon if the sermon is not accompanied with some power? If that's the case, you just fire me. Because the last thing we need is another talk. Can I tell you something? We are all talked out as a culture, as a nation. Like, we, we, this is the age of the podcast. We have more knowledge about God than most of us will ever have the ability to live out in our lifetime. It's not what we need. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, who, by the way, has your best interest in mind, who wants good things for you, who's the only one who can loosen and break the chains and the, the, the things that keep you stuck in life. He's the only one that can do that. And so Peter tries, you know, he goes out there and says, hey guys, we're not drunk, like you would assume, right? That's the Spirit's here, and I want to introduce you to Jesus through the power of the Spirit. So let's read it in verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven. And he raised his voice and he addressed the crowd and said, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain. I got some explaining to do, right? Listen carefully to what I say. And I love this next phrase. These people 
are not drunk as you suppose. Now, I thought that the next thing he'd say is because we're Jesus people and we don't do that. That's not what he says, is it? What does he say? It's only nine. Okay. In other words, hey, give us time, people. First pray, then grandma's cough medicine, right? It's, it's nine o'clock. I don't know where he's going with that. I'm just reading God's word. And he said this, it's only nine in the morning. And then he clears it up. He says, here's what's really happening. And by the way, when he tells people this, everyone who is there for, for Pentecost, it means that they're good little you know, Jewish boys and girls. And so what he's about to tell them is he kind of um, quotes this prophet they already know by heart. What he's about to say, this prophet from, uh, uh, from Joel, this prophecy that's full of hope, this prophecy that's full of inclusion, we need to understand that. And this prophecy that's not just for, for, for rich people or people who have it all together, not for the astute and the professionals or the ones with the plaques on their wall, you know, repping their, their academics and alma mater. This is for everyone. Look at it. He says, here's what's happening. That spirit, the prophet Joel prophesied about, it says, in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on who? Say it again, on who? All people. All people. And do you know what kinds of people were there? Poor people, oppressed people, people who were trying to navigate the, the political turmoil between Rome and, and Jerusalem and all that was happening going on. People who would say, wait, 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 you mean because of Jesus, I matter? You mean because of Jesus, I have a voice? You mean because of Jesus, I don't have to live by, by the, 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 the standards and the things that, that are imposed on me in this class system that we're in? You mean because of Jesus, I can have new degrees of, of fullness in my life? He says, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all people, everyone, your sons and your daughters. He says, not, it's not just for old people, not just for those who have lived a little bit of life, who have some experience. Everyone gets to walk in the fullness of God. Your sons and daughters, they will prophesy. Young men will see visions, but it's not just for young men. Either, he says, old men will dream dreams. And can I remind somebody that you can retire from your job, but you never retire from the purpose that God has given you? Somebody who's on, you know, seasoned in years, you don't retire from that. He says this, old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, meaning the lowliest people that you can imagine, both who? Men and women in a man's world. Both men and women. It says, I, it says, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. I know this is, this is getting weird. We might talk about that sometime. I don't know. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of our Lord. Then he finishes with this. This is the most important thing. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will what? Hey, the highest manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit is that salvation is taking place. Are you with me? It's not that all this other stuff was happening. It's not the fire. It's not the wind. It's not, it's that anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's when the masses, in this moment, salvation is happening. They're crossing over from death to life. This is why we are so fundamentally committed here at this church until, you know, one day maybe when these doors don't open anymore, we will always be about preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus, because it's the most important thing. Seeing heaven get more crowded, are you with me? It's fundamental. Seeing people cross over from, from death to life, it's the highest, most important thing that God's created for us, and he gives the spirit for it in our life, not just so you can be redeemed and saved, but so now you can be a living example and testimony so others can meet God and be redeemed and saved and set free. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I find it fascinating, and here's kind of where I'll start to close this, is that out of all the things that they thought was happening, was going on, they thought they were drunk. They thought they had lost their mind, right? And what's really interesting is that there is actually a biblical correlation for being drunk with wine and being drunk in the spirit. 
being inebriated by the Spirit or influenced by, by the Spirit. There's crossover there. I'll show it to you. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this, do not get drunk on wine. Why? Because that leads to debauchery. Our modern-day definition would be bad decisions. How many of you know that to be true, right? How many of you wake up after the fact, right, knowing that all the stuff that you, you messed up or all the stuff that you, you know, did the night before or whatever you, you, that felt fun in the moment, felt good in the moment, but now you have a mess to clean up. You wake up and there are new degrees of, of bondage and new levels of change attached to your, your life that you have to work through when it's for freedom that Christ set us free. So Paul said, don't do that. Don't get drunk on wine. He says, I understand the temptation to get drunk on wine. I understand in a, in a chaotic world. And can we just have some real talk? Some of you do this too. You drink too much. And you drink too much, not because you're a bad person, not because you're a horrible, terrible sinner. You do it because it's the easiest and quickest way that you can be numb from a hard day. It's easier to get, get drunk. It's easier to, you know, take a few sips of wine than it is to be filled with the Spirit of God because one, you know, takes a, a, a few moments. The other one takes intentionality and it takes faith and it takes believing that God's gonna once again be able to fill you up. And so some of us, we, we, we drink not to, not to change, you know, fill our soul up, not to, you know, change our circumstance. We do it to numb ourselves. We do it to be numb. We do it as a, a coping thing. Whatever it is, and he, he could have listed anything, right? He could have said overeating. He could have said overspending. He could have said drugs. He could have said, you know, um, when you have this overwhelmed sense of materialism and you just have to go out and buy something new and that makes you feel good for, you know, a day or a week or however long until you got to, you know, buy something new again. He said, it doesn't matter. Pick your, pick your drug, right? You, you get to choose. And he said this. He happened to choose wine. must have been the problem of the day. Um, but the point is this, we're notorious for numbing ourselves instead of freeing ourselves and trying to numb ourselves from, from chaos when Christ came to set us free. Not to numb ourselves from the world that we're living in, but to free us so that we can be an agent of change in the world that we're living in. Are you with me? You can't do that if you're constantly numbing yourselves to get through tomorrow. The only way to change is to be inebriated, to be drunk on something else. Not wine, not shopping, not overeating, not, you know, whatever it is, not sex, not anything. The only way, the only thing that can replace that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And I need to tell somebody here today, because apart from that, you don't have what it takes. I hate to break it to you, but you don't have what it takes. This world will eat you for breakfast without, right, God's power working in and through your life. But the point is simply this, it says don't get drunk on wine. That leads to debauchery. Keep reading. He says, instead, be filled by what? The Holy Spirit, on the Spirit. He's not saying don't be drunk. He's just saying pick your drunk. Pick which way you want to be drunk. And here's how you should be drunk. He's saying on the Spirit. That's how you want to be drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. And then he lists a few ways. Not every way we do that, but a few ways. He says, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. In other words, speak to one another in such a way that builds each other up, right? Doesn't tear one another down. When we start to, to sing songs of praise and hymns, and we're about to do it in just a, a moment, when we start to do that, it changes us. It changes the atmosphere. It changes our heart. Listen, you can't tell me after singing and worshiping God, you don't leave here different. Because I see the way that you drive onto the parking lot versus the way that you leave the parking lot. Are you with me? Some of you are a lot happier, you're a lot lighter, you have a lot more joy in your life. I wish we could video it and so you could see the difference. It changes us. He says to, to sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. And then this is key to being full of the Spirit. And this is what we're gonna do in just a moment. We're gonna sing, we're gonna worship, and I'll have the band come out and help me. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. So if you think being drunk makes you weird, Try being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because here's how weird you're going to get. You're going to start doing straight crazy stuff. Like praying for your enemies. Like forgiving those who betrayed you. 
like forgiving that spouse for that affair, when everyone else looks at you and says, why would you do that? Why would you forgive that scumbag when they did that? What's wrong with you? Are you drunk? And you're gonna be like, yeah, kind of. I'm filled with the Spirit. And it doesn't mean you are excusing some behavior. It just means you're not allowing that behavior to, to determine your, your outlook on life and determine your, your joy and your peace. It means that there are gonna be some fights that you want to, to get into, but instead you're gonna turn the other cheek and people are gonna say, how do you do that? When they're coming against you, when they're saying that stuff about you, you're like, because I'm not, I'm not in this thing to win anything. As a follower of Jesus, I've already won. I've already been given victory. And so I'll let people fight and be stupid online and argue about things that ultimately don't matter because I can turn the other cheek because I'm filled with the Spirit of God. So you're gonna be weird. You're gonna be different. Are you with me? Things are gonna happen like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody go to the doctor and they get a, a, a test result and the doctor says, this is what it is and this looks bad. And they go back you know, a month later and get another test result and they can't explain it. You know why? Because the Spirit of God. God healed you miraculously because he did what Jesus you know, did all the time when he was on this earth. He healed people and sometimes I think about our church and I think, man, why does that not happen more? Then it should and I think it's because in our own little way we've taken the spirit and we've put him on a shelf and we've boxed him in and we've, we've suppressed the work that he wants to do. And that's not a, a statement of condemnation. If anything, that's on me, that's on me. All I'm saying is let's go. Let's go if God's spirit wants something more for us then come on, let's take it all. Let's take it all. So I'm gonna have the rest of the guys come back out here and help me. I know I've created some tension um, because here's what some of you are saying. Colby, I get what this means. And I get what God's spirit wants to do in my life, but I've tried and I've tried and I've failed. Or I keep dating, you know, those kinds of guys or I keep, you know, looking at that website, or I keep doing these things, I can't seem to break that pattern. And so this sounds like a really nice little Holy Ghost message, but what does it mean to me? And here's what I wanna to say to you, because sometimes I think because our sin is complicated, and it is, I'm not trying to uncomplicate what you're going through, the chains that have you stuck, all the different ways your, your heart is tied to something, but sometimes because we think our sin is complicated, we also think God's answer is complicated. And it's not. It's not. In fact, here's, here's how he tells us we should approach him with childlike faith. And if we'll just ask him for things, then he is faithful. In fact, read this with me. He says this, so I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone. Hey, listen to me. Everyone qualifies here. This is not certain people. This is not people who've been walking with Jesus for a long time that, or this is your first time checking out church. This is everyone here. We all qualify. Everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks finds. The one who knocks the door will be open. And then he gives us this, this beautiful analogy. He says, which of you dads, which of you fathers? And I'm a father, and so this connects to me. I'm, I'm a father to the fourth power, all right? So I understand what he's saying here. He says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? And I thought, I gotta try that sometime for fun. I'm just kidding. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If then you who are evil, and he's not saying you're bad. He's not saying you're a terrible father, you're a terrible person. He's saying compared to the standard of God, our heavenly father, we fall short. He says, if you though who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven, are you ready for this? Give the Holy Spirit to those who simply do what? 
do not believe, and you can disagree with me theologically, you can argue with me, that's okay. I'm drunk on the spirit. I will turn the other cheek, all right? That's fine. But I do not believe that this is a one-time asking and filling of the Holy Spirit. I believe that upon salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. But the Bible tells us that we can quench the work of the Holy Spirit in, in 1 Thessalonians. The Bible tells us we need to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. So what that means to me is I think there needs to be this constant filling and refilling and rebaptizing of the Spirit in our life. And again, I, I won't argue with you theologically on that, but that's just what I believe. That when you get to the your wit's end, and you're like, God, I don't know what to do. I can't stop looking at this. I can't stop dating these kinds of people. I can't stop doing this. When you finally approach him like a child and you just ask and seek and knock, that he's a good God and he has good gifts for you. He has good things for you. And he wants to fill you with his spirit. He wants to give you that freedom. I mean, he's probably just waiting for you to beg him. He's just waiting for you to, like a child, come before him and say, this is, this is what I need because I can't do this. When you finally get to your wit's end, as a, as a pastor of this church, you know what I pray for more than anything? Your freedom. I, pr I want you to be free. I want you to experience the fullness and the free life that God has for you. So more than anything, that's what I pray for. And I was thinking about this, and I'll be done. And we're gonna stand. In fact, go ahead and stand. We're gonna sing, we're gonna worship. And we're gonna ask God's spirit to once again fill us. But I was thinking of that, that scripture in these terms. This week, my, my boys, a couple of my boys did something that will, will change our relationship maybe forever. They came up to me and said, Dad, I wanna, I wanna fly fishing rod. I'm like, let's go, all right? I'm not even a great fly fisher person, right? But I'm like, let's go because I love it. I love getting out there. I love being in the creek. I love hanging out with my boys in nature, just kind of wading through it. And so I'm like, yes. And how many of you know that when they, they asked me about getting some things that, that I wanted them to have, that I already wanted for them, but they're asking for it, but it was my desire all along and passion to give it to them. How many of you know I ran out to the store and I got a rod and I got a reel and I got some waders and I got everything that they needed. And the same is true with God when he's sitting there desperate for you to ask him, he already wants freedom for you. He doesn't want you constantly feeling terrible and ashamed and guilty of all the ways that we fail. He says, I have my Holy Spirit that I want to give you, to empower you, to live a free life. And if you would just ask me, I'll give it to you. He says, I have a little bit of resource. And it's the same power that raised my son from the grave. And he can raise things in your life as well. So let's do this. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads, maybe hold out your hands if you feel comfortable. I don't care how weird this gets right now. God, I just pray that today you would once again fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would empower us to live the lives you've called us to live. I pray that you would give us freedom. I pray for those that constantly are struggling, that cannot seem to break chains and they're doing it in their own will and their own strength and their own power. And it's only when they finally arrive at this place where they throw up their hands and say, God, I cannot do this apart from you like a child. And as we ask for it, God, you'll give it to us. And so God, I pray right now that you would pour your spirit out upon us, not to do anything, God, but to free us, to strengthen us, to give us the mind of Christ, to give us this this deep-seated love for, for you, God, and then for the world around us. God, that you would change us completely from the inside out. We don't need another talk. We don't need another message. God, we need your spirit. We need your power and your presence working in our lives. So God, we humbly, humbly ask you and even beg you right now in this moment to fill us once again. Pour your spirit out on us in Jesus' name.